Welcome everyone and good evening, or depending on where you are, maybe it's good morning. My thanks to our dear alumni, friends, students, faculty and staff of the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering for tuning in from all over the world. My name is Sonia Dibulio and I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Alumni Relations of the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. Thank you for joining us here online today for the Fireside Chat Discussion featuring Professor Christopher Yip, Dean of the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering, in conversation with Mark Rittinger, U of T Engineering's new Executive Director of Advancement. Today marks our fifth alumni event taking place during this current situation. While we are all acting responsibly and staying home during the COVID-19 crisis, the alumni office at U of T Engineering is excited to still be able to provide you with engaging lectures, presentations and discussions during this time. We are working hard to ensure we continue to create spaces to bring our engineering community together. Just a quick housekeeping item for tonight. Please send your questions to the, for our panelists today in the group chat section. We have administrative staff who are pulling together all of your questions so they don't get lost and will help us to get through as many as possible during the Q&A period. We also ask that you please refrain from any side conversations in the group chat function so we don't distract away from our presentation. So now without further ado, I'd like to introduce our fireside chat participants today. Professor Chris Yip is the 14th Dean of the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. Dean Yip officially started his term on July 2nd of last year. He's a Chem 88 grad, and prior to that, his appointment as, prior to his appointment as Dean, he served for two years as the university's Associate Vice President in the University's International Partnerships Office. As well, he served as the Director of the Institute for Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering. Welcome, Chris. Hey, everyone. Mark, Mark Rittinger is our new Executive Director, Advancement for the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. Mark joined us officially one month ago today. So we'll try and go easy on him, Mark. <laughs> I don't know about me. I, I'll go easy on you, but I don't know about your, your new boss, Chris, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Prior to joining U of T, Mark served as Vice President Marketing and Development with the Nature Conservancy of Canada, working with a team of dedicated professionals across Canada to raise more than $710 million as part of the Landmark Campaign. Primarily, Mark has spent the majority of his career at the Schulich School of Business, eventually as Executive Director of Advancement, as well as the University of Chicago Boot School of Business as Director of Major Gifts and Campaign Director for the New York region. Mark returned to Canada to join the Royal Ontario Museum, ultimately serving as Vice President of Development as well as Interim President for the ROM Governors. Welcome, Mark. Now I turn it over to the both of you and let's get to know each other and find out a little bit more about the vision of the faculty a little bit more. So I can't remember who, oh, so thanks, Sonia, for that introduction, and um, welcome everyone from around the world. I know we've got colleagues here in both in Toronto, and, and I know we've, we've traded some emails with some folks over in Asia, so uh, good morning to those who are across the Pacific. Uh, great to see or to be in touch with everyone. Um, exciting times ahead for engineering. I'm just going to say that in the, in the broadest context, both for welcoming Mark uh, into the new role as ED Advancement, but also as we uh, as we plan what we know is going to be uh, an exciting time going forward uh, into the fall and uh, as we closed out the the spring semester, uh, it's been a it's been an interesting few months as everyone knows. Um, but uh, engineering, as as it's well known to do, has been resilient. We've worked through everything, lots of innovative solutions, and uh, lots of exciting stuff on the go. And uh, it's great to welcome Mark uh, to the to the engineering family to become part of school and. Uh, as Sonia said, it's, it's only been a month, but it's uh, it's been quite a month, <laughs> as it were. So, um, yeah, so this is, I think this is an interesting format. I think normally we'd be probably sitting across from each other in the room and and, uh, and chatting in person, but we're just, we're going to do this kind of like a, an actual interview here uh, online on the radio, as it were. Um, so I guess I get to start, right, Mark? I get to fire yeah. out the first bunch I, of questions. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I have scripted ones, and and you know, Mark, Mark, we we did the interviews. 
you know, I think Mark knows that I like to go off script and all my comms people know that I like to go off script as well. So you never know what's going to come out of left field from uh, from the dean. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to start. I'm going to go easy on you at the start. So so first off, um, Sonia gave us a bit about your background. Um, lots of different experiences and uh, you know, different different environments, different places that uh, that you've worked in this this advancement role. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm super interested. Uh, you know, I, I kind of know the answer, but, you know, maybe tell everybody else, why did you want to come to engineering? Um, what was it that drew you to, to this opportunity? Yeah, well, thanks, Chris. And, and good evening to everybody around the world and here in Toronto and, and, uh, and everywhere else. And it's a real honor to, uh, to be here this evening and, and to, to be having this chat, uh, Chris, with, with you and, and uh, everybody else. Um, you know, it, this is like a tremendous opportunity at this point in my career. I, I, I can't believe it's been almost 26 years that I've been in fundraising and alumni relations and marketing. And, um, you know, the vast majority of that has been in post-secondary um, uh, advancement, as, as Sonia mentioned. But um, but this really sort of feels like a bit of a, a, you know, a capstone opportunity, a culminating opportunity for me, right? To bring together everything that I've that I've learned over over years in uh, in business schools and and uh, arts and culture and the environmental sector, um, and and bring it to, to this opportunity. And, and and I think what it was, um, you know, Chris, we chatted a few times during the recruitment process. I'm just blown away by the depth and breadth of the faculty, the opportunity that we have um, to support. Uh, the work that the students are doing together with the faculty members and, and the ideas that are coming out of of this environment it's just really to me um you know really uh just kind of overwhelming in the early days but just so impressive right and when you and i were interviewing that was all sort of pre-covid and so i like i'm not even touching on the impact that the faculty is having uh, on, on this situation in Canada and around the world, you know, post COVID, I was already, you know, signed and, and sold on, on what was happening, you know, before that. So this opportunity to, um, to make a positive impact on society through the, the research and the teaching, uh, and the innovation that's happening out of the faculty, I, I just couldn't, I, I, it was just such a great opportunity. I couldn't, couldn't, uh, uh turn it down. So. That's great. The uh, I remember the first time we met was I think it was just before the Christmas break. We were yeah. talking and and uh, we were sort of laying out strategies and and uh, it was we were meeting in person. <laughs> I think we had a coffee. We were sitting in my office, and and now we've pivoted um, and we've you know we've got this giant organization, um, engineering, you know, eight, uh, you know. 300 faculty, 11, 10, 11,000 students, uh, 50,000 alumni spread around the world. And we held these great plans and we were going to go out and meet people. And, and now we've pivoted to this mode. And, and so can you talk a little bit about what that, what that trend, what that's been like, I guess, to, to sort of start in this remote mode? Yeah, you know, and, and I'm not alone. We've got other folks uh, across the university that, that are in similar shoes than me, but generally a lot of those folks at least had like a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months uh you know sonia let me into our offices one time a couple of weeks ago even just so that i could see the physical space we were we were apart we were appropriately distant but i had to get some technology from the office and it actually gave me a chance to see where my team sits and 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 you know even that helped because frankly other than than sonia and a couple others at, at the faculty i have actually not met any of the team uh, members that I that I communicate with on a day to day basis and I meet with regularly. So yeah, it's it's all been a bit odd, right? But uh, but we've you know the the faculty managed to complete the term. The students are managing to complete their work. Uh, life goes on. A, you know uh, what I've seen so far from from everybody that I've talked to is the versatility and adaptability of of our faculty. And uh, you know I've had to live that myself. So. I will admit that my old office looks very much like my new office does so <laughs> in my house, but that's okay. <laughs> and, and, and I will say just that the team broadly uh, and, and everybody that, that um, across the university that has welcomed me has been super warm and supportive and literally just sending texts and messages, checking in to see how things are going and so on. So I, I really have to say it's, it's, been, it's been pretty good so far. 
Terrific. Yeah, so we sort of sold you sight unseen on the opportunity <laughs> that were. And uh, I think, you know, to be to be fair, this is a it's a great test to uh, to how well we think things are going to work out, uh, even rolling out know, even rolling out remote um, this, this coming term. You know, we've got this community building. Uh, we, we think this is going to work well, uh, even in the academic sense. So uh, that's great. Um, so I know we've talked a lot about about what we plan going forward, but can you give me a sense of what you think might be the, the biggest priorities um, for for uh, U of T engineering, as it were? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, for me personally, Chris, it's for me, it's got to be uh, about getting to know our alumni, getting to know our donors, um, making sure that, that our team is supporting the needs uh, of, of our uh, communities. Um, so that's a big part of, of getting to, to understand what's happening. And then I, I would say almost similarly important is getting to know the faculty, getting to understand their research, um, and so that I can begin to sort of make those connections between the work that's happening at the faculty and the, and the interests um, and the support that our, that our alumni and sort of broader external communities can, uh, can, can you know, we can use them to, to sort of leverage that work. But, you know, more, more broadly than that, um, you know, excited to be coming into the University of Toronto at this period of time. The Boundless campaign set new records across Canada, across the world, as far as fundraising uh, is concerned. And, uh, you know, as the university sort of gears up to look ahead to its own fundraising priorities, I think for you and I, the, the, the key priority is going to be to, you know, sort of gather and assess what's happening at the faculty and what are some of those exciting visionary opportunities that's going to propel the faculty forward through the next, you know, through the next decade, trying to understand where those, you know, where those key pillars are and then how we can can work with the external uh, communities that we have to, to support that work. So uh, for me, oh, it's a lot of reading and it's a lot of trying to understand, but uh, I know you and I have to hit the ground running pretty, uh, pretty hard over the course of the next six months to sort of get the faculty lined up for, for where we want to be. Yeah, terrific. I'm definitely looking forward to uh, to working with you <laughs> in person <laughs> at some point, getting out there and and I think uh, you know meeting our alumni in person as as we you know the restart starts as we're able to finally get out to travel and, and start to talk to our alumni and and understand what really really draw, drives that community and the engagement and how we can kind of build that uh, going forward. So um, maybe in that same vein, um, you know we're. It, we know it's going to be challenging uh, to run events on campus. Uh, the students obviously were a little disappointed, but we did run a virtual convocation a couple of days ago, and and that went well. Uh, and we know that we're going to be trying to run a physical convocation for our students, um, likely in the spring when we can finally get a big group of people back together. But um, you know, other things are sort of, you know, they're not, we're not going to be able to hold it in person. Um, any thoughts on on how we keep uh, keep our alumni kind of engaged. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is uh, this is a tough time. Whether I'm, you know, here at UOT or at, at the, the, you know, previous organizations that I've been, you know, the basis of our work is really, you know, depends on bringing people together and, and sort of sharing in, in that community. And so there's no question, um, you know, it's it's um, it's a challenge for us to uh, to think about ways that we can uh, enhance that. You know, that opportunity and not be face to face. But as you said earlier on, I mean, we've demonstrated through the work we've done so far that the online uh, community building is working. Um, it isn't going to be the be all and end all, but there, there are lots of things that, that we can do to continue to, uh, to stay in touch with folks. I mean, we will continue to, to host um, the, uh, the COVID-19 alumni discussion panel, which we had recently, the school lunch and learn series. We'll continue to, to host those things. Many of the decisions we make that we're getting together obviously are going to be driven by you know community health professionals that are that are giving us the guidance and the university itself giving us the guidance as to, to what we can do. Um, but uh, but you know staying online, staying in touch with folks. We've got as demonstrated tonight. We've got folks from from around the world joining us, right? So when we had some of our lunch and learns on campus, and you know we had begun the process of bringing some of those online, but many of those were happening you know sort of on campus. We found in many ways we're now attracting a broader audience than, than we had before. And, uh, you know, I kind of joke whether you're on Spadina or Singapore, it doesn't matter to us. If it's online, you can join in. And, and uh, so, in fact, I think there's lots of opportunities around, around what we're trying to do. 
And I think we're going to we're going to be looking at at new innovative sort of strategies, things like these fireside chats. And, and I think we are starting to see in, in a way that the, the technology is making it actually easier for us to reach out and connect. Um, we're able to bring larger groups together. We're seeing this for sure in the, uh, in the academic sphere where um, you know, we're getting much bigger attendance at events. And um, so, yeah, we're and looking for ideas as well from our alums as to thoughts about, you know, what kind of things would you like to see and hear from us and, and different vehicles, especially as you go in this online. But for sure, <laughs> we definitely want to be out there and, and visiting uh, our alums and in, in around the world and really getting a chance to, to see what everyone's been doing, uh, how your engineering um, training and has led you into the careers that you're at now and, and the success that you've had and, and keeping you up to date on on what's going on uh, within engineering itself. So there's there's tons of exciting things uh, on our plate, as it were. Um, keeping in the vein of, of being international, uh, and as Sonia mentioned, you know, one of my biggest drivers uh, for us was this whole idea of, of uh, you know, international experience for my for the students. And um, I had I had set two ambitious goals when I when I started my my position back in July second last year. You know, the first was to have coffee with everybody, and that seems to be working. I'm still having virtual coffees with people. Um, my second goal was that I wanted a for the undergrads to have 100% to have an international experience before they graduated, and this was to the first year class. And so that gets a little bit challenging right now when when we can't travel and, and send students out. But um, any any thoughts on on uh, kind of that international uh, opportunities, uh, things that we could do in that sphere? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that. Um... The, what this has shown us uh, as well is the strength of, of Connect, right? The online forum that uh, that we've created for engineering alumni, um, and uh, you know, bringing together the community and, and uh, sort of finding more more opportunities to sort of operate in that space. Um, and, and as you said, what this has shown us is that um, you know, taking away perhaps some of the barriers in terms of time and, and distance and so on, and bringing people more people out to different events has introduced us to more folks you identified more folks that are that are interested in investing in the faculty and and, and you said it just a minute ago uh you know we would like to hear from folks what what would work for them what would they like to see what are some opportunities that um, that we can explore and, and you know we've got within our own team we've got a couple of brainstorming opportunities set up here in the next few weeks to sort of say okay what's the fall going to look like for us where can we find ways to bring together students i've uh, been meeting with um, uh, with a bunch of folks around the the faculty and, and um, you know uh, met with Roger in the Career Center and sort of talking about different ways that uh, the alumni office and the Career Center can start to work together uh, around mentorship and and uh, you know sort of BEY opportunities and so on. So like I, there, it's a it's a holistic relationship in, in my estimation the alumni relationship with the school and and vice versa right it's a value proposition here so. Um, you know, there, there are lots of ways that we can start to engage with our alumni uh, remotely, even if we're not able to see them face to face. And we can set up these things um, to, to happen sort of in, a, in, a, in an online space. And so we're looking into a bunch of different ways we can, uh, we can bring some of those things online. That's great. Um, you, you just reminded me, we were talking about, about alumni and alumni engagement in different sectors around the world. And I think one of... It, we've talked a lot about about engaging our alumni and, and the career and the mentorship and that. And, and when I was in Hong Kong um, in November, we were talking a lot about making our our alumni there uh, as they hold local events to to be sure to engage our our PY students or our exchange students who are in the region uh, to just you know bring them in as part of the community. I thought that was a terrific opportunity. I know we we sort of seeded. Uh, the Hong Kong alumni group with uh, some names of students who are in the region as well, and and I think that's a terrific opportunity. We want to we want to do that as we as we roll back up into the the normal system. But one of the the opportunities we think is is an interesting one right now, in particular given the current situation, is uh, engaging our alums um, with our students who actually may be staying remote. Uh, in the fall, for instance, our first year students who may decide to, to stay remote for the fall or, or for the year before they come over. And they want to feel as part of the community, but, you know, they're not there. We've got, you know, students who may be in China or maybe in Hong Kong or maybe in India or in Australia, and they've decided not, they're going to register, come in for class, but come in remotely. And, and 
I know the NSOC presidents on on our uh, on the session tonight, and one of their big challenges is how do you build a virtual community for the first year class? And I think there's some interesting ways that we can engage our alums who actually may be in the same cities, um, they're in the same time zones, uh, to build help build that community by by relating some of their local experiences and, and meeting with some of our new students or even some of our returning students who are also staying remote maybe just for the one semester. So I think there's an interesting way to, to start to build that community as well with some of our current students who are uh, at home, uh, as it were, uh, for the next term uh, before they come over. So I think there's an interesting uh, interesting opportunity as well. Um, so um, we've sort of fielded this question a little bit as well, and, and it's really how can, how can our alumni um, you know, help our students, help our researchers uh, in this current situation. I know that once this situation, uh, the COVID situation, as it were, uh, hit, um, I had a number of alumni reach out and say, you know, our faculty doing research in this particular space, we'd love to participate and, uh, you know, what's happening and, and, and there are other opportunities. And maybe you could talk a little bit about some of those uh, opportunities. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly the COVID-19 impact fund for engineering um, and as well the engineering student emergency fund are two sort of immediate opportunities um, that, that alums can can help with financially. Uh, you know, we are looking looking to the fall to, to figure that, you know, there's going to be a lot of students that are going to be in financial need. Summer jobs have basically evaporated, you know, this summer for anyone trying to, to earn any money before they started and so on. Um, student clubs are, are going to be looking for additional funding to to help with projects and so on. Um, so you know there's a you know there will be need and uh, those two particular funds are, are ways that um, you know that alumni can can have sort of an immediate and direct impact on the, on the work of the, the faculty and, and support for students for sure. Great, thanks. Um, I think I got one last question for for you before it's your turn to kind of grill the deal. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Um, and it, it's really, I guess it's the fun one, right? It, it's to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, and you know, some fun things that may have happened uh, since, you know, working with the community or interacting with, with the enduring community so far. Anything yeah. that you've been using? Well, you know, it's, so it, it's, um, I think that's probably the part where the remote thing has probably had the greatest impact is, you know, there, you, there just isn't any kind of real replacement for the water cooler chats or the, you know, the hallway interactions where you get to, you get to meet people. Um, it's been pretty straightforward in terms of, as somebody has said to me something about, you know, that the, the, um, the online space is great to sort of get work done, but it's not, it, you're not, you're not thriving as, as colleagues is uh, in the same way. You got to work extra hard at that. Um, so I, you know, I'll just make one quick observation there. It's actually something that I'm a bit afraid of. Um, our alumni officer, Steve Radborn, I understand he's a, he's a quite a baker, and uh, there's a lot of treats and baked goods that come into the office apparently on a regular basis. And so I've kind of been avoiding, kind of been missing out on some of those extra calories. <laughs> it's actually frankly not a bad thing. And so uh, you know. <laughs> I'm actually I'm actually kind of happy that I've been able to dodge those those extra calories, and we'll see what happens when we get back in person. And uh, I think Steve's got his eyes out to, to to you know get me first. There's gonna be a welcome cake or something for the for your first day in the office. That's uh, right. So yeah, the, the the gauntlet's down. There's gonna be a baking challenge within the advancement yeah. team office. Well, I why well, follow you on Instagram. You're a bit of a baker as well, from what I can see. There's lots of experimentation going on in your household. Yeah. Yeah. So far, it's uh, it's a counter. It's it's uh, I bake a lot, but that's that's I have run a lot in order to counterbalance the amount that I'm baking. So uh, indeed, it, it's uh, it's stirred up the latent the latent baker, the latent cook in me for sure. So um, that's why there's no flour. That's why there's shortage of flour around. Is that that's what it is? That's right, and I think you know part of our plan for the uh, for the kits for the kids that uh, you know the, the for the labs is going to be we're going to send it a biology experiment, which was just, which is to make everyone uh, bake bread and and test out things like you know volume rise of yeast and what's the biology that's going on, and we'll we'll spin it that way as an engineering design challenge. That's right. That's right. Well, listen, I I um. I give you credit. I give credit to all of our my staff. I've got folks that have young ones at home. Uh, you know, I'm a bit fortunate. My kids are, are a bit older and they're kind of on their own. But um, 
I, this has been a real challenging time for folks that have had to balance the work and the home life and and making sure that their kids have an education all this time and making you know making fun things interesting and making interesting things fun so you know you've been great to sort of share a lot of that stuff with um you know with with the students and with the alumni so so you know hats off to you for being able to 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 do that balance that during this period but so I'm not, I, you know, I was going to ask you what, what you've seen your biggest challenge so far as, as being, I mean, you know, you started July 1st last year, right? You're coming up to your first anniversary. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you know, you, you've got to have kind of a pre-COVID definition and a post-COVID definition of what your first year as dean has been like. But aside from all the family and, and balancing act stuff that you've been doing, what's your biggest challenge, been, uh, you know, getting set up as dean and the faculty? Um, you want the, the, the pre, the pre COVID or the post COVID? I think, I mean, one of each, <laughs> one of each, I think, I mean, overall, I think the, the biggest challenge for the Dean, a Dean, any Dean is, is really knowing what everyone's doing and, and being able to, to relate that as you're, as you're going out and talking to folks, uh, telling them the stories about what, what's happening in the undergrad curriculum, what's happening in the outreach opportunities, what's happening at the graduate, what's happening in our alumni sphere, uh, how the engineering faculty is doing uh, and what its engagement is across the university. Um, so learning all that you can about the faculty, I think is for me has been the biggest challenge. Um, I knew a lot about. I thought I knew a lot about ChemEng. I thought I knew a lot about biomedical engineering. But I'm I'm learning more every day, and that for me is the most awesome part of the job is to get a chance to talk to the students, talk to the faculty, even virtually, um, to find out what they're doing. Um, that's both, you know, pre-COVID, it was chatting to the undergrads about what they want to do. That was the coffee with Chris, and uh, I guess it's not really post-COVID. It's like in COVID. <laughs> Is is actually been I've been talking to I've been talking to students I've been talking to our new faculty I've been talking to alums and and catching up with people and seeing what they've been doing um, during this period and and learning about all the cool stuff that people have, have been working on um, that's really the big challenge um, fiscal challenges you know worrying about admissions all that stuff those are those are normal challenges and i think for me it's it's all the other stuff that i want to learn about because that all drives uh the success of the faculty so there's been a lot so you know one of the things that i've you, know, you see this in in a lot of the sort of media coverage uh and and we talk about it on on uh, on the the, you know the chat sessions we have with the staff it's been a lot of inspirational stories inspirational things that have happened during this this whole lockdown period what um what kind of inspirational moments have you had since since this crisis sort of unfolded that you see we're so blessed to have such a strong faculty alumni student cohort and mixing together in this community what kind of inspirational moments have you seen since you've um since you've been sort of uh watching over this period i think i mean what what's been inspirational and what's been um amazing to see was i think i mean there's been no, there's been lots and i think some of the, the the first ones were were just the response of the faculty uh, and F by capital F faculty to the to the pivot right the the Friday afternoon we're closing and to the Monday morning we're online and to see how the staff the faculty the little F faculty and our students in particular how everybody said okay we're doing this we're gonna make this work and it worked right um, that to me was was amazing um the resilience the uh how everybody kind of pulled together and got behind what we had to do to make it work how the whole institution did that i think that's the first one so that's kind of an operational one the other one which was amazing to see actually was almost immediately uh, once this happened we had undergraduates spinning out um programs around tracking covid right like who's you know, tracking people to pose their symptoms so they could kind of supplement and help the public health sector. Uh, we had the Stitch for Corona that popped out as a, an enterprise by uh, engineering students getting together to, to start sewing masks to sort of supplement on, on the mask side. So we had a whole bunch of activity that was almost instantaneously spun up by uh, individual researchers, by students, uh, by faculty, by staff to help out with this whole exercise. Um, and so engineering very quickly um, started to participate in 
you know, the the effort to to fight and and to kind of get into the the battle against the COVID uh, situation. And we continue to expand our efforts uh, in that space. So I think to me, that's another um, just recognition of of our agility um, and our just how engineers love complex problems and want to solve them, right? And uh, everybody just got behind the effort and rolled stuff out. And it's just been, uh, I was telling lots of folks, it's people say, well, you've got to be super stressed. It's got to be tight. It's like actually the team, everyone has been working so well together and with a common goal. And even now when it's, we don't kind of know when this is going to roll back up, that everyone's like, okay, we're, we're going to make this work. Um, and that's, that's what, you know, we're blessed by having such a tremendous uh, cohort uh, in, in the community. Yeah. So you were, you were kind to me and didn't go off script, but, but I'm, because you, you've been here longer, I'm allowed to go off script. Um, you were talking um, in a meeting uh, recently, just thinking ahead for a minute, right? We've got the situation now, we've got the situation this fall, but thinking longer term, about the things that we have learned coming out of this and the ways that engineering can be applied future. That was a really interesting conversation for me uh, to learn more about how we can apply the work that we're already doing longer term. Can you take a minute to talk a bit about that? Yeah, so I think this is an interesting challenge, right? The the There was this acute response, right, to, to the COVID situation, which was, you know, getting asked, you know, rapidly building incubators, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the healthcare sector kind of jumped in on that, right? And engineering helped out. It's got the redeploy.ca type initiative about redeploying stuff. We started to think that engineering is very well positioned to help with the rebuild, right? The whole country, the international rebuild after the situation. Because we've seen how supply chains have been disrupted. We've seen how um, you know, the financial sector is being affected. We've seen how uh, companies have had to reposition and manufacturing has to rescale. And these are all areas where engineering plays a huge role, whether it's infrastructure, right? Uh, redesign of, of surfaces and buildings and better ventilation. It's interior design around how you do layouts. It's, it's scheduling, which is all industrial engineering type efforts. Um, it's the it's building it's rebuilding the, the manufacturing side of stuff uh, how you scale up production locally it's understanding all of that and so it's interesting that engineering all the different disciplines in engineering will play a huge role in how we recover as a, as a global community uh, from this this epidemic it's going to be everything from you know biomedical engineering working on devices and diagnostics to production of vaccines, which is bioproduction, which is scale up, which is chemical engineering. It's all going to get built into that. Um, it's the financial sector. How do you recover when you've got, you know, Bank of Canada rates 0.25? How do, you, how do you recover the economy? This is financial engineering that builds into that. Um, we've seen the growth of the online industry, um, civil engineering on infrastructure. We've got civil engineering groups right now working on ventilation systems and understanding how that plays a role in in the public health sector. So engineering is gonna be integral to the recovery from this. Um, the healthcare sector can't build without engineering being part of that. Um, so I'm really keen for us to roll out uh, an initiative around resilient infrastructure about recovery. And I think that's where we're gonna make our biggest long-term sustained impact. Yeah, it's a, you know it's a double-edged sword, right? We, we're mindful of the situation we've been through and the impact, the human impact that it's had, and so on. But um, it it does sort of put forward a whole sort of suite of opportunities for the faculty to, again, as I said earlier on in in, in my in my comments to you, um, be having a real positive impact on society and, and really making a difference for people, um, you know, in, in a variety of different ways. So. While all that's going on, Chris, there's also lots of stuff that is sort of was underway before the world changed, and, and now we're trying to sort of gear back up again in some areas, right? So the world got put on pause for, for a little while, and, and now it's starting to slowly unwind. How will we continue to press forward with, with some of the big issues? Like I'm thinking of the sustainability lab, um, you know, which I've not seen even the space where that's where that. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I've, I haven't been to Utahis, but I've heard, uh, you know, about the opportunities and the challenges there. Any thoughts on how we start to get these infrastructure projects, you know, going quickly? Yeah. So it, it's an interesting um, point because um, as we've all been at home, it seems like everything else is paused, right? But the reality is all of that has actually still been going on in the background. So all of the initiatives like the sustainability lab, like Utias's uh, opportunities around builds there, um, like the research chairs that we're, we're trying to recruit for, um, all of these programs are still rolling forward. Um, we've gone through approvals to get things like Gull Lake rolled forward. Um, there's a project, for instance, that's been on the books for a while. We were just about to get it out to tender and it was just about to dig a hole and then the province shut down construction and then for three weeks they didn't do anything and now it's been restarted and and for those who are civils on on the call right now you'll be happy to know that that construction has now restarted at gull lake uh and all that stuff is continuing to develop so in fact all of our big initiatives are still underway um the designs around things like the sustainability lab the initiatives uh advancement initiatives around uh, AI chairs and, and robotics initiatives. Um, all of those still projects are still in the works. Um, we're still actively soliciting support for those, those initiatives. And we see tremendous opportunities in particular. Um, they link to the current pandemic, for instance. So there's lots of stuff on the go. Well, that's, that's good to hear. And uh, I, I know there'll be a lot of students and alumni that are interested to know that those projects are, are getting underway. You, you mentioned, I'll get to it in a minute, you mentioned the re, the, uh, the robotics uh, work that's mm -hmm. happening. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, that I've really tried to pay attention to here in the short period of time is, is just the impressive uh, support that we get from our alumni. Uh, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, some of the, the names that are very well known to folks uh, because they're in and on the buildings that we were in on a day-to-day -day basis, and, you know, George Myhall and the Rogers and the Son family, some of these, Paul Cadario, uh, Henry Wu, some of these names, there's, there's times we could spend the rest of the day talking about some of the folks that have, that have helped us out. We know the faculty wouldn't be where we are without them, but, you know, I, I, I just should also mention that, that, you know, we have a, on any given year, we you know we have 2,000 supporters that support the work that we do at the faculty, and it comes at a variety of different levels, right? The um, the the most recent numbers for for last for the last year, you know, we had nearly a million dollars coming in from donors, 1,600 donors at the 10 to 25 thousand dollar range to fund scholarship support student support, uh, you know, faculty research and so on. I mean, that's the same value as a $20 million endowment on, on, on an annual basis, right? So, you know, the support from our alumni at lower levels and at, 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 uh, at all levels really across the spectrum has really sort of allowed the faculty to be able to get started on these projects right away. But, you know, so, so it's a way for me to get around to, to, to the question or the point you made earlier. I'm, I'm also interested in, you know, what does it mean for the faculty to put, create new endowed faculty positions? And I'm thinking about the, uh, you know, the rehab robotics, uh, 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 you know, opportunity or the, the AI advanced materials stuff that's happening. I mean, you know, what does that mean for the faculty to be able to put some of those endowed positions in place? So those, uh, those two uh, are great examples um, of partnerships. So for those who, who don't know the, uh, we're, we're working with the Faculty of Arts and Science, uh, Chemistry, Material Science and Engineering, and the Vector Institute uh, around building a, a new initiative in AI and materials. And uh, the growth of an endowed chair in that particular sector uh, will allow us to, to really build a, a nucleus of folks uh, in an exciting area initiative around materials science, materials design using artificial intelligence. And this is a tremendous opportunity because it actually links computational folks we're looking at a senior group merged in with experimental folks that we're bringing in and growing our faculty complement. so these endowed chairs help us to, to increase our our faculty in those in these key strategic areas so that the ai chair is a good example and that's one that's that's between vector and and two faculties uh the rehab robotics that's a that's a tremendously exciting opportunity between um, mechanical industrial engineering, so MIE, the robotic space, and Toronto Rehab. 
and we see it an awesome opportunity around the rehab robotics. We just launched an initiative, a center for healthcare robotics uh, that's built inside the Robotics Institute. Um, and this rehab robotics would allow us to, to increase our efforts in the uh, air near healthcare robotics. Um, the Robotics Institute, it, it exists physically within the My Hall building on the fifth floor. Um, they're very eager to expand their footprint on the fifth floor. I know that because I have lots of emails from them about, we want a bigger lab. Um, so we're working on that. Um, but this actually integrates uh, the robotics efforts uh, that are out at UTM, which is a growth area uh, in robotics there, our folks downtown and Utah's folks as well. And the rehab robotics now will start to bring in the healthcare robotics. So um, engineering, once again, is, is leading the way within the university uh, around these big initiatives. And yeah. uh, the support through endowed chairs um, really gives us the, the latitude to grow these initiatives because we have sustained support for the faculty and the students and the research efforts in those particular sectors. So it's exciting for sure. Yeah, I always think of those positions as kind of the engine, right? There's so much that, that those positions create in terms of research programs and, and, uh, and just sort of other sort of ancillary projects that happen as a result of those those positions. So they're 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 so important. I, I also again I, I, you know all I said to you the other day all of my whole five weeks of experience right uh, <laughs> together here. But what I was most amazed with the robotics uh, example is again the you know the COVID uh, applications there. It, obviously, it won't. Be, you know, it'll be a while before that stuff is up and running. But you know, if it was ever more important to be able to find ways to have folks doing rehab work in their own homes, it's now. And and so an idea that you know had had application prior to has got enormous potential now. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting to see. And and these are our efforts that you know they're not just embedded engineering but it really reflects how engineering has reached out and, and bridged into other communities into other uh, areas of the university um, we see huge opportunities um, we we're talking earlier about uh, the impact and around the, the restart um, we're looking at building out stronger connections with public health engineering and public health make perfect sense you just start looking at infrastructure um, so we're looking at building stronger partnerships there um, so we see, or I see, tons of, of opportunities. And these are all opportunities that are being driven, not top down, frankly. It's being driven by student interest in these areas, uh, faculty interest in these areas. And increasingly, we're seeing other faculties reaching to us and saying, hey, we, we see a great opportunity. How can engineering start to work with us? Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's been great, or is great. Yeah. One of those other um, kind of more organic uh, kind of examples that I've seen in in, in my onboarding has been the um, the hatchery, the entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, anything you want to report there in terms of things going on and why why that that uh, is group is important for the faculty at this point. Yeah, so the Hatchery, as many know, is is kind of our startup incubator engine, right, for the faculty. And you know, for us, it, it's a it's a place where our students can nucleate their ideas. They can they can launch their ideas, and they can get a sense of how to translate stuff uh, out into the real world, into the commercial context. And we see this, you know, frankly, in 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 that entre build that entrepreneurial spirit in our students. And as I mentioned earlier, we saw with the COVID situation immediately, right? Within a week, you had students uh, growing uh, companies or growing initiatives. Uh, which reflected kind of the training and kind of the, in the environment that the hatchery provides for students. Um, this summer's a little bit weird for the hatchery because <laughs> they're not in the hatchery, as it were, uh, but they continue to run all their programs. And uh, the hatchery has been a tremendous success and uh, continuing to grow the hatchery, its programs, its initiatives through Joseph and, uh, and Jonathan uh, is, a, is a key priority for the faculty. So I see Sonia coming on yeah. here. I think we might be coming to the end of our time. Sonia, can I squeeze one one question in for Chris, and then you can switch it switch over to the questions you've compiled? Sure, only because you're my boss. You're allowed to do whatever you want. <laughs> well, I was just, I'm his boss. I was dying to ask. <laughs> Chris, um, you know, I've heard a rumor that you've got a crystal ball. You can see the future. You know what's going to be coming down the line. Uh, if someone were to come to you and say, like, what is the next year going to look like in engineering? 
how would you describe what what the next year is going to bring for us? <laughs> oh man, um, I was going to throw that eight ball up in the air and see what number pops out. The um, I I see actually what I see for us, I think from a from a school perspective, um, is going to be a ton of really innovative strategies on how we're going to be delivering online online education. I know, and we've started to see what I know what our faculty are doing to build um, the next the courses and roll the courses out for the fall. So I think we're going to see a lot of that innovation. And I think what we're also going to see, this is actually crystal balling like two years out, is we're going to see how that, those innovations that faculty are doing now for online teaching and stuff, they're, how are they going to complement the in-person lectures that when we get back to it. So I think we're going to have a really vibrant um, opportunity for our first year students. Uh, we're going to have some tremendous opportunities for our our returning students uh, in terms of the way we're going to be engaging that community. Um, we see a lot of exciting stuff for faculty coming forward. A lot of initiatives are still in play. We see tremendous opportunities around infrastructure builds uh, coming forward, I think, uh, from the government. Um, so I think we're positioned really nicely. And I actually think strategically, this is a great time for us to actually make some really bold initiatives during this period. Um, so I'm intrigued. I have some interesting, I have some ideas percolating. Sonia knows that I always have ideas percolating. Uh, so I have some interesting ideas percolating right now as to what I think we should try doing um, over the next year. Sonia, somehow I feel like my, that our to-do list just got uh, an extra couple pages longer. Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> I agree. I don't know. Well, we're we're we're, fear, we're we're scribbling down all the notes, and we'll just keep working away. Um, one of the questions posed, uh, um, actually, I'll, I'll I'll kind of spin off of your vision question to to Chris. Uh, one of our alumni asked um, uh, to you, Mark, what's your long term vision uh, for the future for the Office of Advancement? You know, um, I, I approach, uh, thank you, Sonia, for asking that question. I, you know, I approach alumni relations in, in, I said this, I think touched on this earlier, in, in a really holistic fashion. For me, um, it, it, it's very much about a value proposition. It's a two-way street. I see the relationship that our alumni have with, with our institution as being a lifelong relationship. Um, so we need, we need to be able to provide value to our alumni throughout the course of their their existence, whatever phase of the life that they're uh, of their lives that they're at, and sometimes that'll be higher and sometimes that'll be lower depending on where they are in their career and their family and uh, you know what have you. Um, but but I also feel like there's opportunities for alumni to be engaged and to give back in a number of different ways, right? And I touched on this earlier with Chris that I I really think it's important that whenever you you know any of our folks have a chance to hire a position. Think U of T Engineering first. Take a look at what, what opportunities are available. Reach out to the Career Center. If there's opportunities to bring students in, bring those students in. It's, it, it, it enhances the value of the degree for, and the experience, frankly, for, for everybody. If everything that you do revolves around how you, how you think and how you operate in your business revolves around the exchange that you have um, in this relationship with, uh, with the institution. And so for me, it, it, it is a matter of um, sort of taking full advantage of that of that relationship, you know, for our graduates, but also having a you know a hope and a, and, a, and you know hopefully an expectation um, that the alumni will, will be uh, will be involved, um, you know, fully. I you know somebody asked the question somewhere, and you and I, Sonia, were talking about this about comparing the U.S. experience to the Canadian experience, and you know I, I spent five years. In the University of Chicago. I, I worked in, you know, in Manhattan for for years. Um, you know, on some in some ways, yeah, it's a completely different universe. You know, the U.S. experience is unlike anything else in the world, frankly, in terms of that that uh, that relationship. And I would give a Canadian answer to that: that there's parts of that that, that work for us, and parts of that that we're okay with, right? So whether it comes through athletics, whether it comes through, you know, entertainment, but you know. The, the stories I'm hearing about school night and so on, you know, we've got a well-rounded uh, experience that we offer for our students. There's lots of ways for people to be connected. But, you know, the value of being a, 
an ongoing a vocal and visible champion and ambassador for your school. That's the, the element of the U.S. experience, if you will, that I was so taken by when I spent time down there. Um, you know, just how proud and how visible and vocal people were about their relationship. And it is that value, as I say, that, you know, creates this sort of continuous cycle of, uh, of return and reward, both for the institution and for the, for the alum. So anyway, I could go on for a while, but I'll stop there. Well, for me, that's music to my ears, and and I think we do have a, a whole bunch of very very proud alum, but maybe we're just modest modest in our approaches here. I don't know, but I would love to see um, that kind of that holistic approach to the way we um, from the students when they walk in the door as uh, frosh to the moment they um, you know they walk out the door and 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 the time that. It's afterwards as alumni they're, that they're always proud to be a part of our community. Um, uh, Ron Seiden, who is a wonderful entrepreneur and helping our many students, mentoring students uh, across many platforms. He is mentoring a group of students uh, through UTEST. Chris, do you know much about UTEST? Um, he, uh, their students um, have an application due tomorrow for UTEP student, and he's wondering what makes for a successful application. <laughs> so for those who don't know, so UTEP is, is um, UT's sort of early incubator, um, and it, it helps for those who are successful in the application, and, and Ron, fingers crossed for your team, um, there, they provide some some seed capital for the for the uh, the teams to help build prototypes and, and do a little bit before they go to scale. Um, I wish I, I I wish I said I wish I knew what the secret sauce was to get through the the pitch to U test. Um, what we've seen in the past, I think, is a number of engineering um, startups have made it through the U test and been funded through U test. I think uh, Glenn Gulak's had success going through there. Jason Anderson's had success going through there uh, with a number of engineering related initiatives. Um, so I think it's the usual solid product solid uh forecast about opportunity for that particular i don't know the technology ron that you're you're working with um but i think the uh, ones that get through that system um do 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 well uh ut i think puts in 50 percent of the money mars mars innovation uh, or tie app i think is their new name um puts in matching funds to help uh the the teams with that initial sort of seed capital um, but uh, I have not been on an evaluation committee for for you test, unfortunately. So uh, we have another um, question that's come in from Paul Cadario, uh, joining us from Washington. Um, Chris, maybe you have a little bit of insight into this. Uh, so the fall semester will be virtual, like a more virtual. Um, will be going virtual, although I think there, there's going to be uh, some things that we're going to try and do online, from my understanding, as well, or, or in person as well. Person, yeah. um, what is the plan for the winter semester, and uh, particularly for foreign students? And what's the decision point? So, uh, hi, Paul. Thanks. And, and I hope all is well in Washington. It's uh, an interesting situation, <laughs> be an interesting location to be in right now. Um, so yeah, you know, you raise a really good question. Um, we've been planning for the fall, and uh, to be frank, people have been avoiding the discussion about what's going to happen in the winter. We actually just had a, a an internal meeting which showed a number of the different potential profiles for what COVID would do, um, and and various spike cycles, as it were, for the next uh, little while. So um, our plan, and because of the way. Because of the way um, engineering works, it's we're in a better position, I think, than full year courses. Everything's half year courses, um, but we are planning, and I think um, we're going to be looking at, at being ready to have to go um, online and for winter if if we need to. Um, it's a challenge to to plan now eight months in advance. Right now, we're trying to make it, make it four months in advance. Um, so I, I don't really have a good answer. Um, the salute, the, the trigger point, I think is going to be up to 
that little virus that's running around. It's going to make the decision point for us. I think um, people's behaviors largely are going to be the major determinant of, of how this rolls forward. Um, we're going to learn a lot from how schools and, and other things roll out across the country in terms of what the, what the re um, the infection is not a great way to spin it out, but how that how those things uh, take place as as new cases come up, and and how well the system is going to be balanced uh, in order to deal with that. For students, yeah, this is a really tough question. I fielded this last night uh, on the agenda as well. Um, for students, their decision points about whether they come to Toronto or remain online um, is going to be so much dependent on their individual situations. Uh, we know that we're going to be delivering an online experience and online materials that allow them to at least meet their academic requirements. Uh, they won't be as good as in person. Um, and there's all that other stuff that happens in person that's that's difficult to generate you know, outside of the classroom, I think. Um, we think that if students can get into the GTA to get into the same time zone, uh, so you know, to make a, a shout out to John and, and folks that are in Hong Kong. Students who are being in Hong Kong, you're 12 hours out of phase, so that's a little bit difficult if you're, you're having a synchronous lecture. Um, so students who can get to Toronto, they can they can at least be uh, in the same time zone for for synchronous discussions uh, with their TAs and so on. We're going to try to run some stuff in person if we need to, but the key is that, that we're not going to require anybody to do anything in person. Um, that creates an inequity situation for students who aren't able to attend. Um, very fluid, uh, very, very fluid um, situation. I know some schools around the world have just sort of basically said, you know, the whole year has done. Cambridge and, and universities in the UK have done that. Um, U of T has not done that yet. Um, we're just going to think go term by term right now. It's not a great answer, but it's the best I have right now. Sorry. Um, I don't have any other questions that have come in, so I will turn the floor. Oh, I have one. Yeah. How do you expect the students to do any lab work? <laughs> um, Game, yeah, that's a yeah, that's a great. Yeah. So that's a terrific question. And um, so what we're doing right now, actually, as you go, as we're planning this, and and is all the associate chairs. I mean, this is an operational question. All the all the undergraduate uh, departments, um, they're all working to pivot to create um, experiential opportunities, uh, like largely unique uh, for this term uh, going forward. We know that um, for some things, it'll be impossible. So if there are any civs uh, here, you know, field camp and fourth year, uh, that sort of thing, you, we can't do just because public health says you can't have you know groups of 50 people getting together on a bus to go and do field camp so what we're doing there is we're actually deferring that course until the subsequent year so the students will still be able to take it before they graduate because that we, we hope that within a year and a half we'll be back into a situation where we're able to uh, to have groups get together so that's the solution for some of these courses other ones like manage with unit ops things like that um our hope uh, is that this is really just a one-year blip uh, where it'll be, you know, it'll be an online remote experience of seeing the experiments run. It could be a situation where kits are actually distributed to the students. Um, we think this is actually an intriguing opportunity. Um, also, again, where students are able to remotely control the experiments, for instance, as well. So we're looking at all these different ed tech type strategies to allow students to kind of have the same experience. It won't be exactly the same, but they'll be able to kind of see what's going on. Um, we're looking to other universities as well to see what they're doing. Uh, we have an interesting discussion going on with McMaster and what they're doing with Kwanzaa around virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, we're having discussions with a number of companies to, in order to provide resources around that as well. Um, but again, it's just one term. Um, we will never, uh, rest assured, pivot to be 100% online all the time forever. We're going to, this is all going to be on top of what we will do in person. So for the chem engines, yes, unit ops will still exist. You will be running your distillation columns. Uh, for civs, yes, you will be going out to Gull Lake and doing survey camp and, and doing the highway curve. Um, so lots of that will still happen. 
Uh, there's still lots of questions coming in all of it, all of a sudden at the end, but I'm very conscious of uh, that we've reached uh, the, our time. Uh, we will be sending out um, uh, um, an email afterwards coming from my uh, inbox. And I really encourage you all to, if you have a question and you'd like to you know, figure out a way that you can give back to message me, Mark's email will also be in there. Um, and you can reach Chris as well. So just message us because we're really open. This is our community. This is our engineering community and it's for ours to, to foster and ours to nourish and ours to grow. So um, on behalf of you engineering, I'd like to thank Chris and I'd like to thank Mark for participating in our fireside chat today. Hopefully you got to know Mark a little bit better. Um, we truly appreciate you sharing your time and expertise uh, with us this evening. We hope that our audience tonight, uh, which we deem to be some of the closest members of our school community, are inspired by what they hear and know that the future of our faculty and its fundraising and alumni relations efforts are in good hands. While summer may be kicking into high gear, our office will be continuing to plan and look ahead to the fall and beyond. As Chris and Mark discussed today, there's a lot of work to be done and we would love to hear from you, as I mentioned, if you'd like to be a part of uh, one of these solutions. Even if, it all, if the fall looks a bit different from normal, rest assured that the alumni office will continue to bring you virtual opportunities in the future. Finally, I'd like to thank each of you for your support. Whether you give of your time, your talent, your treasure, or all of the above. Thank you for being generous members of our U of T engineering community. Generosity of spirit that will see us succeed in all of our endeavors. And with that, on behalf of the alumni office and the faculty of applied science and engineering, I hereby adjourn our discussion tonight. Whether you're near or far, we're so thankful you were able to join us and we wish you a safe and healthy evening. All the best everyone. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>